get um, started. Uh, welcome to my talk, uh, Efficient Streaming Vector Processing in Scala at Socrata. Um, is everyone having a good time at FOSS for G? All right, let's give a big hand to the organizers. And <laughs> I just got to say, like, this is my first time uh, at the conference. It's also first time speaking here, and so far it's, um, I just really enjoy, compared to a lot of the conferences that I go to, that uh, um, finds a huge variety of uh, folks working on different projects, uh, especially projects that impact uh, NGOs, uh, humanitarian efforts, and it's just really, really awesome to see. Um, anyway, uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. Um, I am uh, principal engineer at Socrata, tell you a little bit about uh, what we do in a second. Um, and um, I'm basically hail from the big data world. I'm actively involved in uh, various uh, Apache projects, uh, Apache Spark, Apache Cassandra. Um, and today we will uh, we'll talk a little bit about why, um, why do we do streaming or wh what is our use case uh, and why, do, why are we trying to do uh, streaming uh, geoprocessing and talk about our architecture a little bit. And then towards the tail end of, our talk, uh, of my talk, we'll uh, talk more specific technical details about implementing efficient uh, geometry processing um, in the Java Scala world. Um, and I um, am uh, I'm very proud to represent uh, Socrata. Uh, we are uh, the open data um, and open government uh, company. What we do is we provide a platform for all of our customers, which are some of uh, the leading cities, counties, states, uh, the federal government, uh, various European uh, and international government bodies, uh, to open up their, their data to the world. And when we mean um, open uh, uh, data, we don't mean uh, what governments have tended to do in the past is uh, they would uh, have data in Excel files or in databases, and they would throw it up as CSVs uh, and a link, and you would have to often like uh, send an email uh, to them or call them to like get this data. What we're talking about is providing a uh, a web service, a nice UI that folks can actually go and look at this data interactively, um, and uh, with nice APIs that you can uh, they programmatically download and actually build applications on top. And I, th I know that uh, a lot of you guys, have, some of you guys, have probably have built uh, apps on top of a platform, which is really cool. Um, this is a really quick recap. Uh, why do we care about uh, open data? I, I don't. I probably don't need to talk about this to this audience that much, but. Um, we believe that um, with public easily accessible open data, we can um, do a lot of really good things to society. We can lower the cost of healthcare, or you could, at least you can find out about the cost of healthcare, uh, education, crime, uh, find out where things are happening, um, uh, uh, climate data. One thing about a lot of this uh, data um, is that a lot of this data is geographic in nature. If you look at uh, 911 data, 311 data, crime data. This is a lot, a lot of, uh, 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 most of it has uh, some kind of latitude, longitude, latitude, or address, or something like that. All right, so, so that's why we care about this data. And um, there's a few examples. So I know this is not a map, and maps are really big things here at this conference, but um, this, is a, this is a plot of, um, of Chicago energy, energy usage by community area. You can kind of see like the bigger squares represent um, the uh, areas in the civic areas in Chicago that are using more energy, and I can. Um, this is unfortunately not interactive, but I can go over each area and see. Like you can see relative to other areas, what you know the energy usage. Um, a a better one is the New York City taxi pattern. Some of you guys might have seen this. Uh, this is off of uh, a, a public uh, New York City taxi data, and you can kind of plot it and get uh, a visualization of where this is happening. Um, this is out of our new, uh, a new UX. On top is a, a coral plath of, uh, I believe this is crimes by zip code in the New York City area. I think that's zip code. Um, and with the heavier gradations representing uh, more crime. Um, and a breakdown, the bottom is not a map, but. Um, so, so basically what we're trying to achieve uh, on a platform are uh, visualizations like this that potentially every uh, citizen can see. So, so the requirements for us, um, 
the, the problem I talk about is what we internally call the geo region coding problem. I'm not, uh, unfortunately, I'm not that well versed in the GIS world, so there's probably some more official term for it, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, but basically, we want to take like points and we want to map it to different regions, like zip codes and things like that. And we want to do it interactively. If someone go to a website, you could have like uh, thousands of people uh, or millions potentially going to, a, going to a website and they see these color paths and they want to render this a, in, at web speed. Uh, so it has to be multi-tenant. It has to work for a whole bunch of our different customers. Um, you know, you could have several maps for Chicago, several maps for New York and you know, multiply this by the number of cities that there are. And, this becomes a, uh, a big uh, web scale problem. Um, and we want to do this with uh, low latency. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, so uh, what we call region data sets, basically um, you can think of things like primes as one type of data set we ingest. Another type of in, uh, data set are just uh, shapes themselves. So uh, they come in as uh, pretty much as shape files. And um, the biggest ones are the national uh, zip codes and census blocks and things like that, which have hundreds of thousands of polygons. The uh, many municipalities, uh, especially cities, have their own, and you guys know this, have their own GIS departments. Uh, they, they want to have, uh, say, police districts and other things like that uploaded. So we, we take those in as well as, uh, you know, as custom shape files. Um, and you know, every time like uh, the election happens, you know, there, there's a possibility that these boundaries might move around a little bit. So that so then we have to upload that again as new versions, and we have to deal with the uh, versioning of these data sets. Um, so here's a a uh, PostGIS query, like the kind of query that you know you can run to do this kind of. Uh, um, Geo-region coding aggregation. I mean, let's say that you have uh, crimes, you know, is, is one uh, table. And, you know, what we want to do is we want to aggregate um, against uh, the geometry that contains that point. So that's where you have the ST contains. Um, and you're grouping by, uh, the, in, in this case, uh, it says ward, which, which is, uh, these are Chicago ward boundaries. And we're going to, and, and this, in this case, it's ordering, uh, returning a top K, although um, we, you know, a lot of times you might not do a top K, but this is an example. So, so here's a question, like, can we do this? Um, you can, can you have this kind of query uh, from a web page? Would, would this work? Raise your hand if you think this would work. Okay, that's good. No, no, nobody raised their hand. <laughs> um, yeah, this is, this is pretty slow. Um, in fact, Um, I, <laughs> so I measured this on uh, my uh, local, I, I don't remember exactly, I think this was on my local laptop uh, on Postgres 934. Uh, it takes, it, there's a lot of ways you can do this. Um, it, it takes 103 seconds for a 5.5 million row data set. Th those are not our biggest data sets. Um, we have data sets that are 20 million rows and growing bigger. Like every day they grow bigger. So, um, so this is obviously not feasible in real time. Um, and this is also a special, uh, there's a note I put about uh, the join is only possible if it resides in the same database. So, um, which, which is that uh, because uh, we, we have we ingest a lot of data sets, and so you can imagine there's, if you shard your data like n ways, um, then your point data sets might be on you know, server A or server B or server C or server D. And we also want to join against the region data sets. So then you have a bunch of different options. You could uh, put these region data sets on every single server. Um, or, you know, but there aren't any like, really good solutions without using uh, something like PG Shard, like a distributed extension to Postgres. Right? So what do we do? We, we pre-process, pre right? Uh, there's different ways to do it. Again, like you can add a new column, you can add a, a join table. Um, you know, so it slows so it slows down when we need to add a new region, but it makes the queries, you know, much faster. Right? That you have a table that essentially now we're doing just a grouping query 
on, say, the ward instead of on, on the point and the geometries. Um, so, so far what I've talked about is standard, like, uh, post workflow is, I haven't talked about streaming yet, so the question is why do you want to do streaming? Um, so, the thing is that uh, for us, uh, the, the latency of when these points coming in is, is important. There, I'll give you an example, like th there are some folks that actually regularly upload updates to th uh, their data sets every 90 seconds. Uh, this is for, for example, for 311, 911 data. Um, they are folks that want to build um, mobile apps on top of this kind of stuff. So for this kind of stuff, ingesting all this data into a database and then doing a join is it, it, not, like, uh, not fast enough. Um, oops. We also wanted an architecture that was generic um, and not just strictly reliant on, on Postgres for the day that is coming when uh, data sets are growing beyond uh, the bound of uh, Postgres and we want to scale things out. Um, so even in the case of small data, doing it streaming gives us uh, much lower latencies. But in the case of, um, of certain things like uh, big data, then um, it, the, the streaming makes, uh, makes this uh, work, uh, it makes the whole thing work at all. And the thing is there are some really uh, interesting new streaming use cases, such as um, cities want to um, stream their uh, bus or vehicle traffic and kind of see things in real time. And so you're seeing more and more cases where uh, streaming is becoming uh, more and more important. And so um, we, we don't want to just hit the database and, and do joins. And, and finally, I'll talk uh, really briefly about, uh, I guess, um, I'm not sure, see, I'm not really sure if I, want, I need to talk about this, but um, uh, why, why, I guess first I'll say why the JVM. Um, that uh, there's a lot of um, especially data processing and, and big data libraries that are centered on the Java platform. But I'll talk a little bit about uh, why, uh, why Scala in the, in the first place. Um, just really briefly, that I don't want to talk about it too long, that it you know, sounds like a pitch. But um, we, we, we are a 100% uh, Scala shop in the back end. Um, but what you've noticed is that um, in the last few years especially, like the, the ability to program to many cores has become extremely important. Um, and with that, you, you found that something, uh, you probably heard about the, the rise of, of functional programming. Like when you work with many cores, then the existing paradigm of um, I'm going to write uh, programs that work a single thread at a time, and um, I'm going to have a concurrent hash map or something that, that mutates. Um, as you get more and more cores, that paradigm um, scales less and less because it becomes, <coughs> um, you often end up debugging well, what happens when <coughs> two people are trying to step on each other and trying to mutate the same thing. So you see more and more people moving towards um, the idea of doing functional transforms. Um, you guys have all heard of MapReduce and Hadoop probably, right? This is all based on the same idea that you start with one set of values. Uh, instead of uh, mutating it, then I'm going to transform it and produce a new set of values. Um, and that maps very well to the, the multi-core and distributed world because um, it, when, I, when I mutate, um, instead of mutating, when I produce a new copy, then uh, whoever is relying on the old copy, you know, they, they're not affected. Um, <coughs> we find Scala a lot more um, concise and productive than Java. I think when, this is before I joined, but we had written a big monolithic thing uh, in, in Java and, and start, slowly started converting over to Scala. Um, <coughs> there's a whole bunch of really interesting projects uh, that are written in Scala, especially in the big data world. Um, you guys might have heard of Apache Spark, which is making a lot of news, especially in the last year, as the, uh, the hottest big data platform that you know, seems like it's um, on its way to repu uh, replacing uh, Hadoop. And I'll, at this point, I'll point out some really interesting other projects. Uh, you guys have probably heard of GeoTrellis. That's the location tech project that is also written in Scala. Um, GeoMesa is written in Java, um, and, and basically, oh, okay, sorry, uh, I, okay, all right. <laughs> and, um, yeah, all right, GeoWave, all right, so, welcome, right, um, and uh, a lot of those projects are based on Apache Cumulo, which, which is written in Java, so there's, there's a 
pretty big uh, collection of projects that uh, are very useful to integrate with uh, in Java ecosystem for doing distributed computing. Um, one thing is that um, Scala offers uh, common paradigms of working with uh, data collections. Uh, so if I have a, an array of, you know, of points, for example, and that's a million elements, I can use paradigms like the map and reduce to work on it. Well, it turns out that a lot of these uh, big data um, libraries like Spark and, and things like Scouting, they all use the same um, idioms and uh, most of them actually use the same method names. So once you <coughs> learn what a map and reduce is, you can then take that and apply it to Spark and suddenly you can work on from a million points to a billion points to a trillion points. It's the exact same code pretty much, which is very powerful. Uh, the, the other thing is that you can take advantage of the Java geospatial ecosystem uh, with libraries like uh, JTS and GeoTools, uh, GeoServer, that kind of stuff. Just out of curiosity, how many folks are familiar with the Java geospatial libraries, the JTS? And okay, so most, so I won't spend too much time going over that. Um, yeah, like I said, we've been a 100% Scala shop for a while. Um, in the back end, uh, we started with. Java migrated to Scala 2.8 and have uh, been moving up and up. As a result of that, um, we, have some of our, we have some homegrown libraries that we probably wouldn't need to homegrown because at the time we started, there, weren't, there was a lot less stuff in the Scala ecosystem. Like we wrote our own HTTP library and um, JSON library and some other stuff. And now there's a big, a lot of options, so, but we're still using our own. So. Here's an architecture diagram um, of how we do what we call the geos, uh, geo-region coding. So at the top, we start with a point data set. As points are streamed in, they stream into a microservice we call the geospace, uh, which is like a stream processor. What that does is it does like an in-memory join uh, with the regions, and the regions are loaded uh, from a geo-json. Um, Shape files that have been ingested in our system and are brought out uh, using GeoJSON. And so what happens is that you start with points and this converts it into, you can think of it as geometry IDs, uh, which could correspond to say a zip code or something like that. And then this gets ingested, um, today it gets ingested into multiple uh, backends, um, Elasticsearch and Postgres and other things like that. Um, and um, in the future, this can also get used for like streaming updates, like maps and you know, this kind of thing. Um, the, our geospace service also ingests shape files and, and parse them. That, 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 that's not really important for the purpose of this talk. Um, just a really brief look at what the, what the geospace service stack looks like. Um, it's based on Scala 2.10. We use a uh, web, uh, Scala web service called Scalatra. It uses uh, JTS and GeoTools. There's also a Scala wrapper around GeoTools called GeoScript.Scala. Um, unfortunately, it's not really maintained. Um, and finally, we have uh, service and discovery, uh, which uh, we use uh, Zookeeper for service registration. Um, I think most of you guys know what this is, but I'll just spend a minute going over the, the Java geospace libraries. There's uh, JTS that virtually all of the Java uh, geometry libraries are based on, um, which offers basic geometry types, operations, um, and some simplification stuff. I haven't used those. And some R3 implementations. Uh, and then there's GeoTools, which uh, is the big application layer stack that offers all kinds of things like feature collections and filtering and in, in interface with databases, so you can easily read those out of database and use the same API to, <coughs> to go through your shapes. <coughs> um, and there's tons of interesting extensions for it, which I haven't played with, but for WMS services, for gridding, and all kinds of fancy stuff. Um, so here's how the, the region coding works in detail, is that um, the request comes in for coding a set of points against like uh, a, a certain uh, shape, a set, set of shapes or, or a shape data set. Um, those shapes are loaded from the back end as needed if they're not in memory already. So we parse the GeoJSON. Uh, we internally we project everything to w WGS84. Um, then what happens is that the, um, 
we use a, an R tree, an in-memory R tree, uh, for uh, fast spatial indexing. And R trees work on envelopes. So you take uh, the geometries and you store the envelopes uh, in the um, R tree. Then uh, what you do is for the point, you, ma you find the matching envelopes. Um, and uh, depending on what you're doing, you can search through the geometries, which hopefully is a very small set because there's only a few that uh, where the envelopes match. Um, it, it looks something like this. Uh, basically, um, let's say my method is called what contains, uh, which returns a sequence of geometries that, that uh, match the given point. Hopefully, the shapes are non-intersecting, so this should really return a sequence of exactly one or zero, um, but you never know. <laughs> so uh, we basically query the spatial index um, using um, the envelope of the geometry. Um, then we're going to filter the list of results because um, there's going to be a whole bunch of shapes that match that potentially match envelope. But but then you actually have to do the the, the expensive operation is the is the covers or intersects where it actually matches um, the geometry against the point, and you're hoping to minimize the number of intersections that you need to do. Um, so how the uh, current, or, or I guess um, the, the first version, how it stacks up against or goes, well, um, the multi-tendency uh, problem is solved because we use uh, an in-memory cache that uses an asynchronous interface. So um, it's relatively efficient. And the reason why asynchronous cache is useful is because um, it, you could have a uh, stampeding hurts problem where let's say that a whole bunch of people are trying to request or geocode against the same uh, set of shapes. So if that shape is not in memory, you don't want to have like n requests to the back end loading the shapes at the same time. So the, having an asynchronous cache lets, lets you, like lets everyone wait on the same, same shape without reloading it more than once. Um, it's, it's relatively fast uh, when the shape is in memory. Uh, it does about 10,000 point in polygon operations per second. I will talk about how to make that go up per thread. Um, the big problem, though, is that when regions are not in memory, then we spend a lot of time loading it. And that delay can be seconds or many seconds, depending on how big that those shapes are. So that, that's sort of the big problem, is that it works well when things are in memory, but when not in memory, that, um, that doesn't work well. Um, and so memory pressure becomes very important. So as more and more uh, region shapes are geocoded against, then those get loaded in memory. Uh, so we, have to regularly, we regularly monitor memory usage. Um, you can do the, the Java runtime, get runtime free memory. Um, just a small note here, like there's, so there's two ways of measuring free memory. You can go by percentage or you can go by absolute number. Um, the absolute number is a lot easier to deal with because if you do percentage, then what you do is you take the free memory and divide it by total memory. But it turns out that total memory is very tricky because um, the size of the Java heap grows. So initially, you might set it to, to be like uh, two gigs, and you say the maximum is eight gigs. But if you read uh, max memory, that actually just returns you two gigs and not what the maximum can grow to. So you have to be very tricky if you're trying to measure a percentage. Uh, we kind of use a hack that we set the, the minimum maximum to the same uh, right now. So like for us, like what we really care about is what the maximum memory that we can allocate um, anyway to start with. So, so we just do that, but um, you have to be careful. But we, so we actively, um, check the amount of memory and we'll purge stuff from the cache, like not, not just, uh, so, so we know uh, roughly the size of the thing we're trying to load and we'll, we'll try to like uh, purge that much memory um, actively. Um, so since memory is uh, such an important part of doing stuff, um, there's, there's different strategies for um, controlling memory and making this work better, right? Um, and we'll go over a whole bunch of those for how you can efficiently use memory. I guess the easiest thing to do is to increase your heap size, you know, which is very easy. And uh, this actually you know, works depending on how big you increase it to, but it doesn't really scale because like, this sort of like, it, it will work for the next few weeks or months. But at some point, we know that uh, there's going to be more and more people using our platform, and like, uh, we'll run out of memory. right? Um, so the first thing you might try to do is you want to shard stuff. So let's say you have, I have two geospace servers. 
Um, so I can just say, you know, I'm going to put like uh, shapes for uh, these shapes, US zip codes in one, and say in the New York world, you know, so I can split it like this, right? So that, that's kind of like a, um, the most, the first thing you might think of. Um, this solves a problem in some ways because then not all the shapes are loaded in, in everything, so th that's good. Uh, however, you see that there's a hotspotting problem because um, your zip codes is much larger than Chicago words. So you end up having this problem where um, you might end up having all the big shapes in, in one uh, server, which is still not good, and, and it's very uneven. Uh, there's a really huge variation in the size of these shape files. Like there's some that have thousands of, you know, tens of thousands of coordinates. There are some that have, you know, many millions. So um, it would work, but again, it would be kind of like a, it would only work for so long. Um, one strategy that I think works very well is what I call partitioning. So let's say that I have um, these, I think these are zip codes across uh, the US. And I'm just going to uh, grid them, right? So, um, every, you know, so I'm going to name, this is by, say, GeoHash. And um, I'm going to just take um, all, everything that's contained within this square uh, and make that as a separate cacheable entity and just cache that. Um, you need to figure out what to do with these geometries th that are on the edge. Um, I think that it's acceptable to just duplicate them. So if something is on edge, you can just store it in both. You know, like this guy, you can just store in this region as well as that region. You can, you can probably clip it as well, which uh, I, I don't think saves you that much space. Um, so. Um, the reason why this works well for us is because for us, most of our point data sets are heavily localized. So most of them come from cities. So um, let's say that I store uh, US zip codes region AE in one server and zip codes region BF in the other one. Um, then um, you're only storing the active regions that, and most of the time when I'm loading points, they come from say one city. So, so this way we can load a, just a small subset of, of the shapes that are needed. Um, and this helps reduce memory pressure as well as that um, long loading time in the beginning when we're loading these shapes uh, from some of the service that gets re that get that becomes um, predictable because uh, on average you're not going to load that many shapes within one area. And this works much better for doing uh, for distributing stuff. Um, I mean, some rather obvious things, like you want to use the same projection for, for everything. And um, if you partition all the region data sets using the same scheme, then that, that helps. I think this is something we're still trying to figure out uh, what it, uh, and, and tune. Um, and for something like this, probably a simple geohash, like the ASCII encoding um, uh, will work. Geohash is very popular and used in, you know, Tons of databases, Elasticsearch, MongoDB, et cetera. Um, we can also use a space fill and curve library, but uh, at this point, you know, since we're just looking for big granular level partitioning, like uh, we don't need to do like nested stuff for, for this problem. There's other places where space fill and curve comes in handy. But. Um, the other way that you can make things more efficient is uh, instead of loading less shapes, you can also make the geometries more efficient. Um, the idea of compression, of trading speed for storage. So um, here's a memory layout of, uh, of a JTS polygon shape. So starting from polygon, uh, it has a linear, what is called a linear ring, which is the outer um, a part of the polygon. And then some polygons have holes in it. So those are called holes, and you could have more than one hole. Each linear ring is actually a coordinate sequence. And each coordinate sequence is a bunch of coordinate objects. Now, uh, Java objects are not that memory efficient. In fact, each coordinate object takes 40 bytes for uh, just storing two doubles, x and y, which is uh, kind of expensive. Um, so one thing you can do is, um, let's say that you can store, let's say you store your whole geometry as uh, WKB, uh, which is a lot more efficient, and you can decompress and cache on demand, which uh, does work, but 
but it's a little slow. It turns out that JTS has a built-in uh, thing called the packed coordinate sequence, which internally actually stores it um, as a bunch of arrays of doubles. And it will expand on demand, which is, which is pretty nice. There is a really easy way to transform a, a polygon um, in JTS to another one that uses a different coordinate sequence. And it's called the geometry transformer. You just need to override one method called transform coordinates. And so as you can see, all I'm doing is saying I'm taking the old coordinate sequence and, and um, creating a new packed coordinate sequence. And you can apply this to um, any polygon and get out a more compact representation of that polygon, which is pretty useful. Um, so the results of doing this is that um, you will get at a minimum, uh, or you get a maximum savings of 60% less memory uh, because you're going from 40 bytes to 16 bytes per coordinate, uh, which is great. 60% is great. Um, now, if, unfortunately, if you expand, if this was to, um, if you were to use every single geometry that you stored in memory, it would end up using more memory in theory because it has to have space to unpack. Um, in practice, what happens is that um, the expanded uh, coordinates are uh, what are called a soft reference. So in, in Java, if you have a standard object, um, it's not garbage collected until all the references are gone. But a soft reference is where if you start running out of memory, it will then um, get rid of the soft references to, to free up memory. So um, this does help the memory usage in that you can put a cap uh, on the memory usage. And um, you know, you can, if, you, if you explicitly do a GC, for example, then it will get rid of all the soft references. So, so, you can, so this, allows you to, um, this allows you to use, have a minimum floor for memory usage and um, fill it on demand. But at the same time, you can still control it, which is, which is pretty nice. Um, if you don't, if you somehow don't uh, cache or expand on usage, and, or let's say that you were to generate a coordinate sequence, a, a bunch of coordinate objects every time someone uses it, I, we didn't measure the um, slowdown from that, uh, where if you really, really need to have minimum memory usage, then you pay a penalty of like maybe like a 37% slowdown, uh, which is significant, but if you really need to save memory, maybe that's acceptable. You know. The other really cool trick is that you can use something called prepared geometry. So um, it uses very little memory. It basically uses some alternate uh, algorithms for doing intersections and covers and things like that. This is a huge speed up. So if you're doing anything in memory, this is highly recommended. Uh, in our test, it gives about roughly a 10x speed up. Um, and if you combine this with the packed coordinate sequence, now you have something that is memory efficient and extremely fast. So, so that is what we have um, deployed to production today. Um, just a note, I do have a GitHub gist up. Uh, if you really want to explore the area of memory efficiency and, and geometry, um, it's, you can implement your own custom coordinate sequence, just like the pack coordinate sequence. For example, like if you have a lot of small geometries, which we do, like for the cities, um, you might have a lot of small uh, police district boundaries. Um, what, Storing, you might be able to compress this down to say a float instead of a double uh, because um, the delta between subsequent coordinates is actually very small. Um, so you can use techniques like that if you want to really save more memory. I think we're at a point where like, um, things are memory efficient enough that we probably won't spend time to pursue this route, but there are cer certain cases where this might help. Um, finally, I'm going to just do really quickly uh, to take this um, to frameworks like Spark. Um, in the same way that we have multiple parallel um, streaming instances, let's say you want to do a big batch job, uh, you can think about two ways of partitioning your data. One is that if I have a lot of big shapes, um, then I can shard them and partition them, like just like we talked about, by region. Um, you might have cases, and I think this is more common, is that you might have a lot of more points than shapes. Then maybe you partition by points and you use some of the techniques I talked about to try to fit all the shapes onto every node, uh, or maybe some combination of the two, which really just depends on your workload. Um, finally, I'm looking forward to um, some 
uh, f an interesting future work, uh, including geo vector processing in Spark um, and collaboration with some of the location tech folks, uh, uh, including putting uh, GeoMesa uh, on on Cassandra. Um, so, yeah, a lot of a lot of neat stuff coming. Um, a lot of our stuff is open source. The Geospace server is uh, open source. We also have an open source tile server. Um, and um, GeoJSON parser and things like that. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>